Today we're going to look at John chapter 13, and we're just going to look at two verses, specifically verses 34 and 35. That's Pew Bible, page 900, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inerrant, inspired, eternal word. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to him dependently this morning in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts and minds. Your word has been read, and so now your word is to be preached. And we ask that by your Holy Spirit that we would hear with joy what you have to teach us today. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You and I need love. In fact, scientists tell us that love is a basic human need. In fact, the need for love and the ability to love is what is part of what makes us human. Neither you nor I know anyone who doesn't need love. And I would imagine that all of us would agree that our world needs more love, not less of it. This, of course, is a topic of utmost importance for the Christian. As we have been loved from eternity past, as we are loved in the present, as we will be loved for into eternity future, we as the beloved, well, we're to be people of love. Now, the Bible has much to say about love, even actually defining it for us. For example, in a passage many of us are familiar with, rather than impatient, love is what? Patient. Rather than hateful, love is kind. Rather than lusting after what others have or bragging about what we have, love neither envies nor boasts. Rather than think too highly of self or rather than demeaning others who disagree with us, love is not arrogant and it's not rude. While our flesh encourages us to fight for our rights, love does not insist on its own way. Our emotions, well, they may vacillate from peak to valley and from valley to peak, right? But love is never irritable. We may resent the blessings that we see that God gives others, but love is never resentful. While we may believe the end justifies the means, love doesn't ever rejoice at wrongdoing, and love believes in the truth. While it is hard to believe, considering all the difficulties of this life that we live, love really does bear all things. It believes all things, it hopes all things, Endures all things. The issues of today, newsflash, that grab so much of our attention will pass away. But you know what won't pass away? Love. Love will never pass away. And of the three Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love, 
In that beautiful chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us what? The greatest of these is love. Now, given the importance of love, as it is defined in Scripture, it should not surprise us to see it commanded and actually taught tangibly to God's covenant people. For example, as was read earlier in our Scripture reading from Leviticus, under the Old Covenant, and actually in the context of theocratic Israel, God commanded love to be shown in very practical ways. For example, when reaping the harvest, the edges of the fields were to be left. When gathering in the grapes from the vineyard, the vines were not to be picked bare. Intangible acts of love, grain, and grapes were to be left for the poor and for the sojourner. Similarly, ethical conduct was considered showing love to others. Something that seems to be lost on modern culture. For example, not stealing, dealing honestly, telling the truth, seeking the common good, paying a fair wage, helping the disabled, remaining impartial in disputes, and not slandering. These were tangible ways that God says, these are how you can show love. But it was not merely outward acts of love, was it? The heart attitude mattered. And so God commanded in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. Now it should not surprise us then that love was a central theme of Jesus' ministry. As God is love, Jesus is love in the flesh. In word, in deed, as we study the gospel accounts, Jesus reveals the love of God. When asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Do you remember how Jesus answered that? Jesus answered that question, what's the greatest commandment? With two imperatives of love. The first one, first imperative of love was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And what was the second one imperative of love? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in those two imperatives of love, Jesus perfectly summarizes the two tables of the Decalogue. Jesus, you see, he spoke. Jesus served. Jesus lived the love of God. And Jesus' disciples were witnesses of it. But shortly before his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension, Jesus said to his disciples this, our text in front of you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That's a curious statement, isn't it? A new commandment. Had God not commanded love before? We know that's not the case. Was love not imperative among God's covenant people under the old covenant? Well, we know that's not the case. Then what does Jesus mean by a new commandment I give to you? And so I want to begin with this. A commandment of love. A commandment of love. In studying this passage, some people have concluded that Jesus' new commandment defines the distinction between love for neighbor and love for one another as Christians. Now, I agree in part with the validity of this interpretation, but I think that there is more to it than just that. The key is in considering Jesus' simile. Look at the text with me. Quote, Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. What's the significance of this statement? What is the weight 
of this statement of Jesus? Well, consider, if you will, the expression that God frequently uses for His love for His, co- old, for his covenant people in the Old Testament. For example... And there are a number of places that we could go, so I'm just picking one at random. But if you were to go to Psalm 118 and to walk through the psalm of song at the beginning of Psalm 118, you would hear this. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. The intentionally repeated praise emphasizes what? It emphasizes the nature of God's steadfast love for His covenant people. Now the Hebrew word that is used there, steadfast love, is the Hebrew word hesed. And depending on the context in which that Hebrew word is used, the word can be translated as, as it is here, steadfast love, but also in other contexts it can be translated as kindness, as it is in the book of Ruth. For example, Boaz showed hesed to his future wife, Ruth. That is, he showed kindness to her. The key to understanding the meaning of this Hebrew word is in the difference between a stranger and a loved one. Hesed is never used in referring to someone you do not know. Someone that God does not know. It is a relational. It is a covenantal concept. In the Old Testament, there were God's people and there were those who were not God's people. And Boaz, speaking of his kindness to Ruth, he would marry Ruth. He knew her relationally. As one commentator puts it, Hesed is enduring covenant loyalty and love. It refers to an unwavering commitment and is often used of God's permanent, unchanging love. Now, understanding this, now I want you to consider what Jesus has said. I give to you a new commandment. Jesus is the embodiment of hesed. He is the embodiment of God's steadfast love. He's also the fulfillment of God's law. Therefore, the newness of His commandment is in the revelation of God's steadfast love in the Son of God and the like kind love among His covenant people. Just as God has steadfast love for us, so we are to have steadfast love for one another. Or as Jesus puts it, Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Same kind of love. Or, if I may summarize, we who have received the love of God in Christ are commanded to love as Christ the church. And so I want to look at The second aspect of this love, and I'm titling that a community in love. A community in love, meaning Christ's church. The greatest expression, the greatest expression of God's love for us is the atoning sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. In fact, foreshadowing this expression of love, Jesus told his disciples this. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And so he did, didn't he? The cross of Christ, so to speak, manifests the love of God. Here's what John wrote in his first epistle. He said, in this is love. Meaning, I'm going to define for you the picture of the love of God. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us 
and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, it is a specific, it is a relational, it is a covenantal love. It's a steadfast love. It's a hesed love for us. It is then this love, this love of God that we are to have in the church. In fact, we are defined by love, a community in love. But what does this look like? We could talk about love all day long. But what does it look like in the church? Well, the Apostle Paul, in the passage that was read earlier, gives us a metaphorical example of this kind of love. And he uses marriage to teach us about love in the church. In chapter 5 of Ephesians, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of one body. We are the body of Christ. And if I may extract from that passage, which we often use to teach on the topic of marriage, and rightly so, but if I may take from that to teach us in the church what does steadfast love for one another look like, there are three things that I would draw out of that passage in Ephesians chapter 5, that this love of God in the church is sacrificial, it is sanctifying, and it is selfless. If you're taking notes, I'm referring to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 30, drawing out these three words, that is sacrificial, sanctifying, and selfless. Allow me to elaborate on this because I think it's important for us to understand tangibly what does this love look like. In the church, we are to love one another sacrificially. John considered this to be actually an essential characteristic of the church. In 1 John chapter 3, he wrote, We have come to know love by this. That Jesus laid down his life for us. Thus, we ought to lay down our lives for our fellow Christians. Such sacrificial love means eliminating man-made conflicts that affect our love for one another. For in Christ... Paul says we have been unified into one body. Hmm. In their brilliant booklet titled, How Can I Love Church Members with Different Politics? Jonathan Lehman and Andy Nacelli write this. Jesus did not design our churches to be a national or ethnic or class gathering of a political party. Rather, He designed them to be gatherings of his followers from every tribe and tongue and nation. Your church and ours are communities of former enemies learning to love one another. (laughs) I think that's brilliant. We're former enemies learning to love one another. And this is not to say that such love comes easy which is oftentimes the way that we think about it. God has justified us through faith in Christ. We are justified as righteous. That is our right standing before God. And sometimes we think of that truth in regards to love and our love for one another, forgetting that actually 
we have to be very intentional about it. Because according to my flesh, I don't naturally love. And late breaking news, you don't either. It is intentional. We are learning to love one another. And it is in Christ's church that we learn to love one another sacrificially in Christ. Thus the importance of the local church. Secondly, in the church we are to love one another sanctifyingly. Note in Ephesians chapter 5 how Paul elaborates on the importance of how Christ is sanctifying his church. And you and I are to love one another enough to encourage our spiritual maturity. Do you care about my spiritual maturity? I care about your spiritual maturity. We, as the local church, are to care about that. Here's the way the writer of Hebrews puts it. He says, and let us consider how to... Stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Such love requires faithful, diligent investment in one another. Faithful, not passive, not being a spectator. It requires our faithful and diligent investment in one another. On this point, J.C. Ryle adds that we should regard one another as family and delight to do anything to promote one another's happiness. We should abhor the idea of envy, malice, and jealousy towards a member of Christ and regard it as downright sin. <laughs> We can count on Ryle to get it right, can't we? In loving one another in Christ, I would put it this way, you and I can't be armchair church members. We can't be pew sitters. We can't be merely spectators of what's happening. You must engage physically and mentally and emotionally and of course spiritually. And you must love in a way, as the writer of Hebrews is saying, you must love one another, we must love one another in a way that fans the flame of Christ's likeness. Because it is in Christ's church, not outside of it, but in Christ's church that we love one another and we learn to love one another sanctifyingly like Christ. Thirdly, In the church, we are to love one another selflessly. This is what Paul said to the church at Philippi. He said, instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. more important than yourself. Consider this, that your fellow church member, your fellow church members are some of the most important people in your life. Do we think of the local church that way? That the members of the local church are some of the most important people in your life? And that you consider them is more important than self. Your concern for them is greater than concern for yourself. And love for one another transcends all of the worldly concerns that divide us. Again, Lehman and Nacelli, I love the way they put this. They said the local church (laughs) is where enemy tribes start beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. It's where black and white, rich and poor, young and old, educated and uneducated, American and Chinese, sanitation worker and senator unite. And it is in Christ's church that we learn to love one another selflessly. Just 
like Christ. But is God's glorifying and Christ exalting, sacrificial, sanctifying, and selfless love in the church? How does it edify one another? And what is the story that is being told? What is the story that is being told through the church? Because the church is a confession of love. That's exactly what Jesus is saying in this passage. The church is a confession of love. It is one thing to enjoy Christ-like love in the church, but it is another to realize how we love one another is telling. The world is watching. Before he died, R.C. Sproul wrote these convicting words. We're living in a time of crisis. Many Christians are decrying the decadence of American culture, and complaining about the government and its value system. I understand that. But if we want to be concerned for our nation and culture, our priority must be the renewal of the church. We are the light of the world, Sproul wrote. And he was right. Revival will not come through the president. Newsflash. It's not going to come through Congress. It's not going to come from government. It will not come through a surging stock market, and it will not come through a cure for COVID-19. No, the love of Christ shines through the church. The love of Christ shines through the church. And if we are truly concerned about our neighbor and not just giving lip service to it, if we're really concerned for our neighbor, we will love our brother. If we really care about a nation, if we really care about a culture, if we really want to show love to the world, we will start with loving our brother. John writes in his first epistle, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. And so it's a, it's a defining value of love. In fact, J.C. Ryle says it's not merely a notion in your head, it's a practice in your life. Love is a practice. It shines through the church. It is as practical as the commandments in Leviticus. Grain and grapes. And it is as beautiful as the life and death and resurrection of our Lord. And when we as the church love one another as Christ loved us, that love shines through to the world. Demanding a fitting response. May the world watch and see and say, certainly these are the followers of Christ. They have been with Jesus. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, that is our desire, that the love of Christ would shine through us. That people would not look at us and see our division, but rather they would look at us and see Christ. And so we pray today that you would have mercy upon us. We pray for the church across this land, you would have mercy upon us. We pray in this very local church, in very tangible and practical ways, that you would encourage, enable, and in encouraging and enabling us to love one another as Christ loves us. For we pray all of this in the name of our Savior. Amen.